Good morning. I'll share a story that, of an encounter I had with a man in the community this week. I talked to him, and he, he was not a believer, is not a believer, and he was struggling to move forward with the coronavirus. It was just a spontaneous conversation. He didn't come into my office or anything. He wasn't sure that he'd be able to return to work. He needed to return to work. And he could see that restrictions were more and more being lifted. And he would be expected to return to work. But he wasn't ready to return. He had no pre-existing medical condition. He's strong, healthy, and not quite at the age group of special concern. He's not caring for anyone who is especially vulnerable. This is someone who lives with risks every day that he has embraced as normal. He realizes that our county has over 64,000 people and there are only six known active cases of COVID despite a dramatic surge in testing. And yet, he has encountered something over the past two months that cannot be quantified. It cannot be tied to scientific data and it cannot be reasoned away as foolish. He has looked his own mortality in the face, and it has scared him. He will not live forever. Death is in his future, and he's not sure that he's ready. And I don't think he's unreasonable. I asked, is your concern about getting sick, or are you concerned about dying? He thought for a minute and said, I think it's the dying. That's not unreasonable. Listen, if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have not turned from your sin and placed your trust in the work of Jesus Christ on a cross for your forgiveness before God Almighty, you have reason to fear death, amen? <clears throat> Life should terrify you. The darkness and uncertainty of eternity waits. And this world is full of risks. I would say even a small risk of something so terrifying ought to be a cause for great concern. And of course, there are so many things that are outside of our control. You certainly can't be confident of a healthy tomorrow. One day you wake up sick, right? Ravi Zacharias was fine in February. One day he woke to terrible pain after a surgery, and in a matter of months, due to a diagnosis of cancer, he was ushered through pain and suffering to the doorstep of eternity. Kilton Holmes, from our very church here, was fine, and he went, uh, as, as we moved on as a church, to virtual services in March. He was excited to get back. One day he woke up sick, cancer as well. And in a matter of weeks, he was ushered through pain and suffering to the doorstep of eternity. My grandfather, 40 years ago in March, was fine until his appendix ruptured while in Rochester, Minnesota. The best doctors in the world could not save his life. Fortunately for him, Jesus had saved his soul. In a matter of hours, he was ushered by pain and suffering to the doorstep of eternity. There's no script for how our lives will end. Well, there is, but we don't get to write it. <laughs> we don't get to read it ahead of time. Well, I just named three Christians. What about the tenuous state of the unsaved? Maybe we should be amazed, not that we find people who are afraid of death, but that we find so few. Oh, we have lots of reasons to fear these days. We just had a stunning worldwide response to a worldwide pandemic. And of course, fear of a virus, amazingly, just kind of got swallowed up, didn't it, in the last 10 days? Spontaneous protests of the injustice done to a black man were within a matter of days overshadowed by what I would consider to be some sort of outside groups that sure appear to have a very well-orchestrated, militant assault on the very notion of the rule of law. Oh, there's an underbelly here that I just don't think is necessarily going to go away 
or be solved, even by the best intentions that we have of bridging the racial divide. I'm not trying to be dramatic, but I believe it's very possible. There are growing ideologies in this nation entirely bent on dividing us as a nation and establishing a very different future for America. And if I'm right, it's not going to be very pleasant for Christians. One way or another, <clears throat> we are in the <clears throat> excuse me. We are in the part of the story where things get worse before they get better. We live in a very troubled world. Insecurities, unknowns around every corner. Oh, we're not the first ones to experience things like that. I've heard interviews, maybe you have too, with World War II veterans who survived insurmountable odds in horrific battles. And when they were asked, how were you not paralyzed with fear in such a dire predicament? How did you continue on? They usually simply say something like, well, I was too busy to think about it. I had a job to do, and I just did it. Well, I don't know if you're like me and you ever get tempted to be a little overwhelmed by all that's going on in our world today. It's tempting. As I watch the news, all different reports, just seems like they're competing ominous thoughts going around. But I want to say, this is my point of all this introduction, I want to say that as this world intensifies in tensions, and as we find very real reasons for very real anxieties, I don't think it'll serve any of us well, and I don't think it will most honor our Lord to become consumed by the dreadfulness of it all. Or as our heroic friends might say, we don't have time for that. You have a job to do, and you ought to do it. Well, I'm not against social engagement in the least, uh, but some of us are getting absolutely overwhelmed with this stuff. It's driving you crazy, all these anxieties of today. And it's consuming too much, I would say, not only of our, our thoughts, but too much of our time and our energy and our emotional energy. Yeah, our thoughts and our speech. Well, what's your job? Focus on your job. What's your job? To be an empowered witness to testify to the good news of Jesus Christ. Do your job. This world is in disarray, and you're not in a position to soak it all in. When you're tempted to be paralyzed with fear in life, remember, you've got a job to do, and it's time to do it. I've seen that quote going around about Mr. Rogers a little bit lately. Mr. Rogers says that his mom uh, used to say, when things get bad, there are hard times, uh, look for helpers. There are always helpers. I like that. Well, I would say when things get bad and people need a message of hope, I hope they can listen for witnesses because there will always be witnesses. Well, Acts chapter 2 describes a church in a seemingly chaotic world for Christians in particular, with pers persecution awaiting at every turn, with protections really unknown. The future could not have been predicted. But the one thing that was clear for the first believers, the church at Pentecost, their mission was clear. They were to be empowered witnesses. I can't do sermons on overcoming anxiety forever. At a certain point, I'm simply going to call you to be reminded of what you are here to do. Well, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, we read those last week, and they talked about this incredible community that the people of God enjoyed, and uh, we're going to hang there this morning for a little bit. Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. And they, 
the first converts, the early disciples, thousands. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. All right, from just verse 42, I see four focus areas. I don't know if you've ever been an athlete or you've ever been in the military or you've ever done any special mission in your life. Usually there are things that your coach or uh, whoever's leading you is, is going to call you to focus on. Focus on these things. Well, what did the early disciples focus on? Four focus areas for empowered witnesses. Verse 42, and they, first of all, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to what? To the scriptures. First focus area for empowered witnesses it's devotion to the scriptures. Now, I could say a lot about the Bible, right? <clears throat> well, this isn't that kind of sermon. This is the kind of sermon that says, do your job. Read it. At Walnut Hill, we are unmistakably, unashamedly, and unswervingly all about the Bible. We are not Walnut Hill, I think, church. We are not Walnut Hill Winds of Culture Church. We are not Walnut Hill Pastor Dan Says It So, So It Must Be True Church, although that one has a bit of a ring to it. We are not Walnut Hill All the College Professors and Popular Entertainers and Professional Athletes and News Media Folks and Big Tech Ideologues Love It Church. We are Walnut Hill Bible Church. The Bible is amazing. I could say a lot more about it, but for today, today it'll suffice to say, it's time to get at it. It's time to do your job. If there was ever a time to make a point to start reading your Bible, it's now. Don't think too hard. Just do it. Now is not the time to be theoretically in the Word. Now is not the time to be theoret theoretically a Bible-believing Christian. If you've never made a point of having a consistent routine for being in God's Word, you do not need to wonder if the Lord is speaking to you today. <laughs> he is saying, yes, this is for you. We have far too many professing Christians who know everything about everything but they have a cursory familiarity with the Bible. Make your routine today. Many of you have your own routine. I know I'm preaching to the choir, right? You come to first service. You're disciplined. You have your routines. Some of you like the daily bread. I know Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, I would see next to Dad's bed growing up the daily bread. Dad loved that as his routine. Maybe that's yours. I put out a challenge around Easter time to read through the Bible, and a number of folks joined me in that. Maybe it was no surprise, but that group is actually filled with people that know the Bible. There are all sorts of folks that have read their Bible and know a lot about it, and you know what? They want to know more. We have this discussion group of what we've been reading for the week. And after our discussion on Monday, just 30 minutes after we were done with the study, I got an email. And the email read something like this. 
Well, I did want to understand the scope of the sacrifices. We we're just going through Leviticus. We're reading through Leviticus, all right? We're working our way through Leviticus. Is that an easy part of the Bible to get through, Butch? That's a tough part of the Bible to get through, right? Lots of liturgical rules and regulations for sacrifices, for the priestly uh, duties to be accomplished. Well, this person responded, I did want to understand the scope of the sacrifices. How often? Daily? Was this done all day and every day? How was this accomplished with over a million men and women? Were these collective sacrifices or for individuals? Did all the sacrifices have to be done in sequence for the respective offense? Were the burnt and sin offerings done in conjunction with each other for atonement and repentance? Could grain, peace, and sin offerings be done as worship? Was the role of the sons to keep the altar and furniture clean, ashes removed, and keep the fire smoldering? Was the dirt at the base of the altar removed to prevent disease? When did these practices end? What led to the decline of these sacrifices? I don't know if she views herself as a silver saint, but she's at the age where she could be if she wanted to be. And she wants to keep learning and growing. And apparently she wants her pastor to be learning and growing. She doesn't want to just have her eyes read over the words. She wants to understand the Bible and what was happening among the people of God thousands of years ago. And she can, so that she can better understand the God of today. He's the same. He doesn't change. His character is there for the understanding. Do you want to know him? Get to know the God of 2020 B.C., and you will know the God of 2020 A.D. He's the same. They devoted themselves to the Scriptures. Second area of focus they devoted themselves to the fellowship. Many of you are absolutely remarkable. And I'm, I'm going to call this devotion to the church, devotion to the fellowship, devo devotion to the gathering of the body of Christ. Many of you are absolutely remarkable. What a heritage you have or are now leaving for your children and your children's children. You go to church. And this isn't just something that you do. This is something that you are. You do a number of things. I wrote a few down. You gather. Remember being in Africa and we were in this village church. It was amazing even getting there on this road. I don't know how far it was, but it took hours to get there because these roads were so tumultuous. And we were there with those who were worshiping in these villages. And, and we were hearing stories of how far they traveled to get there. Some had traveled for hours. They had hiked for hours in this predominantly Muslim nation, this pre uh, almost exclusively Muslim island uh, of Zanzibar off of Tanzania. And these people literally hiked for hours to get to church. And guess what? They didn't just leave in one hour. They didn't go to first service and go home. They stayed there with the body of Christ. Well, that's, that's like many, many, many of you you are Walnut Hills faithful. I mean, it, we, ha we have services, rain or shine. I don't remember a week that we've canceled the service because we know they're going to be, we might cancel children's programming because we don't want to, or, or all programming because we don't want to force people to try to get here, right? We don't want leaders to feel the responsibility to get here. But as long as a pastor can get here um, and, and we can hold a service, we're going to do that. And many of you are exceptionally committed. You, you gather, you serve. Many are visible servants. We see all sorts of people serving in this church, but many are behind the scenes and don't maybe even want to be recognized. You're serving the Lord not for the sake of recognition. We had a nominating committee to find new elected people for the, the coming year. I think it took about three days with some phone calls to get all the positions filled. So many people, maybe in part in light of COVID, but so many people in this body are excited to serve and give of their time and energy and resources to serve the Lord and the body of Christ. You invest in relationships. I had a professor at 
uh, seminary uh, at, at Trinity that talked about an open hand approach to relationships. He's saying approach people in relationships with open hands. Don't approach them with fists. I'm not talking about the whole bumps. That, that's a little different. It was just a different metaphor here. You know, or don't, don't approach them like this. For, he said, approach them with vulnerability. Be open as a pastor. Love, love your people. Let them know you. And you, to get to know them, we're meant to have this relationship among one another. We're not meant to just come and show up and go home. We're meant to invest in one another's lives such that we can speak into each other's lives. We can admonish one another Rebuke if needed one another. Uplift one another. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And you support the mission. You support the mission. This, it's unbelievable. Have you ever at this church, ever, I'm, how, I'm, I'm 46 years old, feeling it. I got marks all over me from falling while trying to play basketball with these kids. And I get, you, you just don't fall pretty anymore. 46 years in this church, I don't know that I've ever heard an appeal for money. Now, I, there might be some special project we're letting people know, but I don't, you never have heard anybody have you say, well, we're struggling with our budget this year. We're going to need you to turn up the giving. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Now, listen, there might have been a few raised eyebrows with this whole COVID thing, right? There might have been, a, the trustees might have had kind of an, an interesting look to see what was going to happen, Right? Or we're not passing offering plates anymore. People are all at home, right? There's uh, some collective eye peeking going on. The trustees, maybe programming leaders, the staff, our missionaries out in the field, they're all interested to know what's happening. And, you know, we just kind of decided provide opportunities and the faithful will find a way. The faithful have always found a way. And God has been faithful to us. And God has used many of you. you. You support the mission of the church. And then you go. You engage the mission. That's what we do from end to end. We gather and we go. We gather and we share relationships together, serve the Lord and each other. And ultimately, we're about this mission together. We go. Well, the third area of focus, they devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. They devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. For that, I'm going to say they had a devotion to the cross, right? Well, how did I get from bread to a cross? Well, we're going to do that in just a minute, right? As we celebrate communion. The breaking of the bread here is a reference to eating together. They ate together and they were to have an orderly time within that meal to eat and drink in remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross. The early church was focused on Jesus crucified and raised from the dead. Well, we'll get to that one a little bit more in just a minute. Jesus Christ died for your sins. That ought to be a focus point as you engage this very unsteady, unpredictable, ever-changing world. There are some realities that don't change. The cross of Christ ought to be ever before us in our minds and hearts. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, and they devoted themselves, finally, a fourth focus area, they devoted themselves to prayer. They had prayers. Devotion to the cross, and then a devotion to prayer. We want more faith, right? We want more faith. Well, when do we get more faith? I'm going to keep saying it, just as an encouragement and reminder. We grow in faith the most through hard times through adversity. Well, you should know that faith isn't automatically forged in hard times. You draw near to the Lord, and he draws near to you. I question sometimes 
whether we're drawing near to the Lord. We so easily draw near to social media. We draw near to our favorite talking heads and podcasters. We draw near to our favorite pastors. We draw near to everyone's opinion but the Lord's. We fail to draw near to the Lord. I've shared this story before, and um, it's a good one, and I, I hope it'll be one that you're reminded of again and again. So I share it again, but John Wesley was an accomplished preacher. This is from his notes, diary of January 25th, 1736. Different world. He was an accomplished preacher, and he turned into a traveling evangelist, making his way to the colonies of America to witness to good news of Jesus Christ. And he had a life-changing experience. On the, he's an accomplished preacher and a traveling evangelist. And yet he encountered Christians who displayed a faith he could hardly comprehend. Now oh, listen, I feel that way all the time, right? My mission might be to, to speak and preach and lead. That doesn't man, mean I don't stand in awe of the faith of others and pray, Lord, give me the faith that is before my eyes. One night they were all of a sudden in an incredible storm, a life-threatening storm. And this is what he said. He first tells a little bit about these Moravian Christians and then uh, a little bit about their character first. He says, at seven, I went to the Moravians. I had long before observed the great seriousness of their behavior, of their humility that they had given a continual proof by performing those servile offices for the other passengers, which none of the English would undertake. He was English, so he's saying, you know, the people I've seen, they, they were serving in ways that, that others just wouldn't serve for which they desired and would receive no pay, saying, this is what they said, it was good for their proud hearts, and their loving Savior had done much for them. But then he says, okay, that was one snapshot, then later. Now, there was an opportunity of trying whether they were delivered from the spirit of fear as well as from the, that of pride, in the midst of the psalm, so they're having a service together, singing, where their service began, the sea broke over, split the mainsail in pieces, covered the ship, and poured in between the decks, as if the great deep had already swallowed us up. A terrible screaming began among the English the Moravians calmly sung on. I asked one of them afterward, were you not afraid? He answered, I thank God, no. And I asked, but were not your women and children afraid? He replied, no. Our women and our children are not afraid to die. From them I went to their crying, trembling neighbors and pointed out to them the difference in the hour of trial between him that feareth God and him that feareth him not. At twelve the wind fell. This was the most glorious day which I have hitherto seen. Who feareth the Lord and who feareth not Brothers and sisters, we were not made to be consumed with the concerns, even in our times of great, great trial. We were made for a remarkable faith on our glorious mission. I'm going to try to do something this week. I don't know what the crew before me does. We've got all different types. But join me if you want to. You know what I've decided? For a week, I'm going to fast from news. I'm not going to watch any. Now, I might have somebody that I let know, hey, if something big happens, let me know. 
but I don't want to read it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. I need some time to focus on the Lord and get myself oriented to the mission that God has given me. Join me if you want to. No news, no smart news, my phone, no TV news, no talking heads, podcasters, no talk radio in the car. I always like to turn that on. No social media. Uh oh. No Facebook. Things just got a little serious for some of you. And every time I think, oh, I'm going to check and see what on my phone. Every time I think of that, I'm going to say, oh, that's right. I'm fasting from all that stuff. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray during that time. I'm going to pray to that. Have you ever fasted before from food? Oh, it's wonderful. You know, part of, part of the wonder is you, you, you feel something. You feel a little bit of hunger. It might be the toxins leaving your body, or it might be real hunger. But you feel hunger. And you know, when you're fasting to the Lord, not just fasting for dietary reasons, those reminders, oh, you turn those into prayers. Those are the times where you pray. and You, you turn that hunger into a hunger for the Lord. Well, as, as I'm really interested in seeing what's going on on my phone. Oh, that's right. Not this week. I'm just going to see what happens. But in those times, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for three things. I'm going to pray for the world. I'm going to pray big. Big prayers for the world, for our nation, for our missionaries, for the lost, right? Big prayers. And I'm also going to pray for our church. I'm going to pray for the unity of our church. I'm going to pray for those who are hurting and struggling in many different ways in this church. And I'm going to pray for me, right? I'm going to pray for me. I'm going to pray for my heart. I'm going to pray for my mind. And I'm going to pray for my faith in moving forward. It's time to do our job. And I don't know <clears throat> how we're going to do it. If we're listening to everybody talk about everything other than our mission. We've been set free. It's time to live like it. I'm going to ask the elders to come forward at this time. Um, Dan and Bill up here, Ed down in 180. And if there's anybody that didn't get communion elements, we're not going to take it for granted that you saw them coming in. If there's anybody planning to participate in communion that did not get the elements, I'll just invite you to raise up your hand. And then, guys, you can, if there's nobody, you can make your way out. We did a good job uh, first service. I didn't want to take that for granted. And you can go ahead and begin preparing to take the bread. So take off, I believe it's a clear tab on the very top. Take it, that top tab off, and you should be able to secure a little wafer there. The admonition of the Lord's Supper was to remember his sacrifice. We're called to do our job, which is what? To simply bear witness to a job we couldn't accomplish. To work done on our behalf. He did the job, right? He didn't fixate on the dangers all around him. He didn't get distracted from his calling and mission. It was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame on our behalf. I'm going to ask the elders to come back and provide me the elements. <laughs> I was so prepared, Teresa.
let us eat in remembrance of him. Then you can prepare the cup. The mission we share is to tell of blood shed on our behalf for the forgiveness of sins. He did the job. He submitted to every kind of temptation. He endured every kind of trial. And his life was determined to be undefiled. He was our spotless lamb. And his blood was found to be atoning for our sins. As they say, there were nails in his hands and in his feet, but it was his love that held him there. Let us drink in remembrance of him. Let's pray together. Lord, I know so little of what is to come. I'm like a soldier given his orders, and I don't really, I, I know what I need to do. And that's enough. I don't know the end of my story, but I know the end of yours, and I know I'm in it. I can live with that uncertainty. Lord, keep my focus on my mission. Keep our focus as a church on our mission, Lord. May we be marked as empowered witnesses for your glory and our joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go out and sing again at the end of our service here. And I'd like to just encourage you to do even better at distancing out there, okay? This is what I'm. This is what I'm going to ask too. If you're young and in great shape, like Dave Emery over here, move past the doorways and maybe onto the blacktop ramp a little bit. Give a little space. 180 will come out. Maybe just find a spot on on the ramp there. And if you need seating, if standing for a number of minutes is tough, or um, Please take seating if, if you're, like in my, let's call it my parents' category, if you know my parents. I don't even know what to call them anymore. Um, there is a little bit of seating out there, and I really would like those seats to be filled up. So if nobody takes them, um, if you're a little older and, and sitting might be nice, please take those seats. But let's spread out when we get there, move away from the doors, and let's close our service by singing some praises to our Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen.